morning, good morning. A beautiful day on it, isn't it? Gorgeous day. Let's stand this morning. Beautiful day. We serve a beautiful Lord. Amen. Let's worship Him this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you're all powerful and awesome. God. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Lord, we pray that you being a mighty God, Lord, we ask that you will do mighty things this morning. God, that you would work in a mighty and powerful way on our hearts, Lord. God, that your word would pierce us. Lord, that your word would challenge us. God, that your word would encourage us to just long for a deep and intimate relationship with you, Lord. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we want this morning to be about you. And we just ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, amen. Amen. Good morning again. Before you grab a seat, make sure you introduce yourself to your neighbor. Say hi to him. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Glad to hear it. Well, uh, a special warm welcome to those of you who may be new and visiting our church this morning. We're blessed to have you here. We're excited that you're going to be able to join us as we continue to teach through the whole counsel of God. Um, it's basically what we do here. Uh, we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Amen? Amen. And we're going to be covering uh, most of 1 Timothy chapter 3 today, and uh, we'd love to have you follow along with us. And it's, it's going to be pretty easy to follow along. You'll notice uh, in a bulletin that hopefully you've been handed as you came through the doors and were welcomed, uh, there is a note sheet in there. It also provides you um, verse references that Pastor Ron is going to cover as he goes through, and it'll give you a gauge on uh, how far along we are into the sermon and whatnot. And also, um, for those of you who are new, we'd love to get to know you a little better and find out how we might be able to minister to you uh, as leaders at South Oak Calvary Chapel. And, and there is a welcome form in the bulletin as well. Uh, we'd encourage you to fill that out, and after you've completed it, um, after the teaching of God's Word, as you walk back, you can just drop it off in, um, in one of the two tithes and offerings boxes located at the rear, or excuse me, the back of the sanctuary. And uh, as soon as we receive those requests from you, we'll be acting upon those as quickly as we possibly can. And also, we have newcomers' luncheons each month where we get to see your face, shake your hand, get to know each other a little bit better, and there's always sign-up sheets on the information table, so I would encourage you to do that as well. Uh, a few more things uh, before we get underway. Um, we have some baby dedications as well, so I'm super excited about that. Um, cell phones. Uh, if you do have a cell phone with you today, which I'm sure you do, as most of us probably do, uh, it's a good time to silence those or to turn them off completely. If you do need to leave the sanctuary at any time during the teaching of God's Word, we simply request just to minimize distractions that as you come back in, you'd see yourselves in the last few rows, and the ushers are always there to assist you if you need help. And as always, immediately following the teaching of the Word and during the last couple songs of worship, we have ministry leaders on either side of the platform, the stage, that would love to pray with you and encourage you uh, in the Lord. So God bless you guys. Um, make sure you take a look at the bulletin and see all the things that we have coming up. Amen. Good morning to you all. It's... Uh beautiful day. It's a great day for baby dedications. We've got a potload of them. We've got a couple of them to do today, which is very, very exciting. I want to invite uh, Lily, Lily Lynn Johnston to come on up, and any family members that want to uh, join you would be fine. Um, she was born November 4th, December 4th. I just, it just looked like November here. No, December 4th. Is the 4th right? Yes. Okay, okay. December 4th this year. Well, last year. 2009. <laughs> Jason, why don't you come on up here and let's... I think I'm going to just stop there and leave it at that. Little Lillian, and before we uh, dedicate her, I love baby dedications. I, I just, I, I love them because it's an opportunity for us as a church body to just uh, really stand in agreement uh, with the parents that these little children would be raised up in the, in the ways of the Lord. Uh, and so uh, Robert is going to share a verse that, uh, and it's a, great, it's a great verse. Listen carefully to it. Uh, Joshua 1, 8 through 9. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it, in it day and night, and you may observe and to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, 
nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, we chose this verse um, due to circumstance of the pregnancy and also um, the we, we want for Lily to not uh, worry about the things that are going on around her, but also just keep her focus on God. Amen. Amen. This is a little gift from heaven here. There was uh, there were some challenges with her coming into this world, wasn't there? God was faithful. We were praying for Rachel, and just as we as we pray uh, most every week, just for the. Uh, just full-term pregnancies and healthy deliveries, and God is faithful. Here's a perfect, perfect living and breathing example of God's faithfulness. So will you join me as we pray uh, for, for Lily Lynn and just pray for God's blessing upon her life and his, his care and protection for her. Let's pray together. Father, we do come before you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. We just thank you for the precious gift of, of Lily Lynn Johnston, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness and your kindness, Lord, just for answered prayer. Lord, what a great, great verse, Lord. We pray for her. We pray, Lord, uh, for her, her parents, Lord, uh, Robert and Rachel. We ask, Lord God, that you would just wrap your loving arms around them, Lord God, that they would be eager, Lord, to instruct her in the ways of the Lord, to just instruct her and encourage her to meditate on the law day and night, Lord God that she might observe to do according to all that is written in it, Lord God. We pray that we might, as a church, stand with her, uh, Lord God, that she might be strong and of good courage, never to be afraid, never to be dismayed, and that she would recognize, Lord, at this early age, Lord, that you are with her wherever she goes. Father, thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for bringing her safely into the world for the, for the testimony, for the little memorial stone she is of your grace and your mercy and your love towards this family. We pray that you would bless the Johnston family, Lord God. We thank you for them being a part of the church body. We pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified in Lily's life, glorified in it. We pray that she would just continue to be nurtured uh, in the ways and the love and the admonition of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege you give us as your church body, uh, Lord God, to be a part of her life and a part of her mom and dad and, and brother's life. We pray these things, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Check those shoes out. You know some of you ladies wishing you had some shoes like that. You know that's true. All right, we want to invite Nick and Tasha Moore and her family up here. Little Ezra James. Ezra James. And her big brother. I was asking little Ezra's... Oh, he's down. I was asking Joey, his big brother, if he liked little Ezra. And he said, thumbs up. Liked him and uh, was treating him right. Was treating him good. So Nick's going to uh, share, and of course this is a special. You can you know this is a big day when Doug whips out a tie and <laughs> firefighters for Christ pin. That's a serious day here. Okay, uh, the verse we picked was um, Ezra chapter seven verse ten. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Teach the statutes and ordinance in Israel. Amen. Amen. Right on. You did her, man. You got it. You got through. <laughs> All right. Look at this little guy. Look at this little guy. Oh, I'll tell you what. Many of you knew, know just the testimony of the Lord moving in this family's life. And I, I love Nick's heart for the Lord. 
I love Tasha's heart for the Lord when uh, they got married. How long ago have, was it? About a year and a half. Okay, about a year and a half ago. And uh, if you just knew their testimony, if you ever get a chance, just ask them their testimony. It is just an amazing thing. And I know that those tears uh, that Nick is, is, is shedding are, are tears of joy and thankfulness to the Lord our God for what he's done. And so will you join me as we pray for little, I'm going to go ahead and let him slobber my shirt a little bit. Um, as we just pray for little, little Ezra James, what a great, great name. I love that verse. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and, te- and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Let's pray together as we dedicate little Ezra James to the Lord. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we rejoice as Nick and Tasha and Joey's church family, uh, Lord God, uh, and, and joyfully dedicate little Ezra James more to you, O oh Lord. We know that their family and his birth is a living testimony of your might and your mercy and your grace, O oh God. We thank you for the living testimony of this family that you take broken things and you transform them and you make them whole. Lord, we ask that little Ezra, Lord, would be used all the days of his life, that he would be a young man, Lord, that would seek the law of the Lord and do it, Lord, and that he would be a teacher of your word, Lord God. We pray for an anointing on his life in accordance with this verse, Lord God, and his name, that he would be a teacher of the word to many, Lord God. Use him, anoint him in a mighty and in a powerful way, Lord God. We stand in agreement, Lord, with Nick and Tasha, Uh, that he might be dedicated unto you. And we agree, Lord, with his family and and with her sister and with her her mom and dad, Lord God, that he would be used mightily for your kingdom. And we pray all of these things, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. I wanted to see if, get him used to being behind the pulpit like that way. What a great, great name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So much to be grateful for and thankful for. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just asking. There's a lot of, you know, one of the things that, that is just remarkable about the body of Christ is that um, there's a whole list of people, uh, one of the dear sisters, uh, uh, after service came up and hadn't seen her in a while and just shared that, that she'd been diagnosed with cancer. And um, there's just a lot of, a, a lot of trials and, and challenges that are going on in the body of Christ. And, you know, at the same time we're praying and having a baby dedication and just rejoicing in new life. Um, just this last week, uh, uh, a part of our church body, just this last Sunday, was she was serving in the in the children's ministry, and uh, and she got a phone call that uh, her her daughter or her sister uh, Jenny and her husband, uh, her brother-in-law Brock, Brock Jenny and, and Brock, lost their two-month-old son. And we can't understand those things. We we can't comprehend why God allows birth and why He allows death and. Uh, why he allows, you know, Myron and Liz, Sorgan Fry, Myron lost his dad just yesterday, who was old and had suffered with Parkinson's for a lot of years. And we see God's mercy in that. But it's hard to wrap our brains around, Lord, why do you allow certain things? And the only thing that we can do in those settings is, is, is to say, God, we trust you. We trust you, Lord. We don't need to understand. We know, Lord, that you hold our very breath in the palm of your hand that you know the number of our days and i love the uh, as as difficult as it is sometimes to understand it i just love the contrast of birth and death joy and sorrow it gives us a picture it gives us a perspective of our god and who he is and the fact that he is in control amen he's in control so will you join me as we pray just for the various things, and and we give him praise for all of the things that are going on in our church body. Father, we know that we are just but a small part of your, your body, Lord, the church body, Lord God, the body of Christ. And we're grateful for the people that you have gathered together here. 
Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would just be with those who are hurting, Lord. We lift up Danielle to you, Lord God, and just encourage her, Lord God, with this recent diagnosis. We pray, Lord, that you'd prepare her heart, Lord God, for the test results tomorrow and then the, and then the radiation and the, and the surgery, Lord God. Oh, Father, we pray that you would prevail. We entrust her into your care. We pray for others in the church body that are hurting. We continue to lift up uh, Logan, Lord God. We lift up Kaylee, Lord God, these children, Lord God, who have dealt both with brain tumors and brain cancer. Father, you are the divine physician. There is nothing too hard for you, Lord God. And we stand on your, the promise of your word. We believe that, Lord, with all whole, our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. We lift up Brittany to you. Lindsley Fazard's friend, Laura, to you, Lord God. We pray for Brett Peckham as he prepares to have surgery, Lord, this coming Tuesday. We pray that the surgery would go well, and we thank you and praise you, Lord, for how well Autumn's surgery went, Lord, and we pray for a quick and a full recovery. We continue to lift up Erica to you, O Lord, in her situation. We do lift up, Lord God, the Brocks, Lord Jenny, and, or, or Jenny and, and Brock, Lord Julie's uh, sister and brother-in-law. Father, just wrap your loving of arms, Lord. There, we don't have words to say to someone who lost their little one, Lord God, but you do. We ask that you would comfort them and that you would encourage them. Be with the Sorgan Fry family, Lord, as they grieve the loss of Myron's father, and just be with them at the memorial service this week and bring them home safely to us, O oh Lord. We pray for all of those, Lord God, who are serving in the military, and we ask that your hand would be upon them and that you would bring them home safely to us, especially, Lord, uh, we pray for the protection of those who are serving in harm's way. We pray, Lord God, for the loss of this pastor at Real Life Family Center in Tacoma, Lord God. We just pray that you would comfort the church body and that they would lean on you, Lord God, and that they would draw their strength from you, we pray in Jesus' name. We pray for all of our missionaries, O oh Lord. We especially, Lord God, want to uh, lift up to you uh, Chris Rep, Lord God, who's returned from Haiti and just strengthened in the Lord. We ask that you would give her good rest and relaxation as she prepares, Lord, to go back to Haiti as soon as she's done here, Lord God. Just pray that that would be, continue to be a fruitful time. Lord, we ask that you'd be with our children's ministers and that you would just encourage them as they minister, uh, Lord God, to uh, our little ones, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord, for them. We ask that you'd be with Charlo, Lord, as he uh, ministers, Lord God. Uh, to our junior hires, we're so very, very grateful to him and ask, Lord God, that the word would fall on the fertile soils of each of their hearts, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, just for this morning. We ask now, Lord, as we enter into a time of worship, that you would use the worship, Lord, to prepare our hearts, not only for the word, but just to, to encourage us in the spirit that you're sovereign and that you're in control and we can find great peace, joy, comfort, and encouragement from you, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
supreme in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, just for the encouragement and the comfort that you bring to us. As we delight in you, Lord, as we look to you as our Lord and as our Savior, Lord, we need you in our lives and we cherish the time that we can spend together. Be glorified in all that we do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're having some major technical difficulties. It seems like, like I might have some magnetic charges in my body or something that cause it to pop. It's making me a little crazy. It must be that metal plate in my head. No, I'm just kidding. Why do I say things like that? They have no relevance whatsoever. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> How many of you remember playing Follow the Leader <clears throat> when you were grow growing up? You remember that? How many of you remember the song, Follow the Leader, Follow the Leader, Follow the Leader, wherever he may go? Do you remember that? People, it was on Peter Pan. Peter Pan was the one that sang it. I didn't know that till just yesterday, and unfortunately, I had to watch it in German. So I'm going to do it in German for you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not. <clears throat> Well, this morning we're going to look at what is, I believe, to be one of the most crucial subjects in Christianity next to salvation and sanctification through Jesus Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to live our lives in a manner worthy of being called a Christian. And that is the subject of Christian leadership. Christian leadership and specifically what are the qualifications of a church leader. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 3 is all about. But before we get into the heart of our text, I want us to understand what I believe to be the significant placement of these qualifications uh, neatly placed right in between chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 4 in the context of what Paul is trying to write to Timothy. Uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago we saw in chapter 1 Paul, he spoke of the importance of teaching no other doctrine than that which he had been teaching, namely the forgiveness of sin and salvation through Jesus Christ. We know that Paul was very well aware of God's grace uh, and the glorious gift of salvation because he, uh, he was ever aware just of his own sin. Because remember, he had purposed himself to destroy the church to destroy those who had been called out of sin, out of darkness, out of the grips of Satan, placed into the wonderful, comforting arms of God. And he also understood that there would be those who would stray from the faith. There had already been those, as early as the church was, there had already been those who had strayed from the faith and they had turned, uh, a, they had turned to fables and idle talk and they had begin to, begun to draw other people away from the faith. They personally had rejected the faith, and as a result, Paul described it as suffering shipwreck. In chapter 2, Paul talks about God's ultimate desire that all men be saved. That's what he wants. He sent his son that all men might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
And then towards the end of our study uh, last week, he addresses the issue of authority, the importance of praying for governmental authorities that God has placed over us, although never to compromise God's standards, who is the ultimate one in authority. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. And then finally, we touched on that touchy subject, and yet Paul spoke it clearly. He addressed that natural order and authority that a man has over a woman. And then uh, it is after this that Paul talks to Timothy, this young pastor of the church at Ephesus, this place where he had spent three years of his life investing in that church. Paul had done that. And he speaks to Timothy about the importance of making sure that the leaders that the ministers in the church are qualified and that they accurately represent the Lord. And what these verses that we are looking at today do is they set the stage for what we're going to see next week. I want you to just uh, look forward just a little bit to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at the first two verses. We're going to pick up in verse 14 through uh, uh, chapter 4, but look at these first two verses of 1 Timothy chapter 4. He writes, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so Paul, he's warning Timothy, he's, Timothy, you've got to watch out for the church. You've got to watch out for the flock. And he, I believe what Paul is saying here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 is key to preventing such things from happening, that is, the departing from the faith. Uh, people giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons and the prevention of having people's conscience seared. It is good leadership, I believe, what Paul is saying that prevents that from happening. And my desire, and I believe that the Lord's heart for us in our study this morning, is that every one of us here this morning, when we leave today, that we would leave with a good, solid, biblical foundation and understanding of what the qualifications of a church leader are. And that's for two purposes. Number one, that the leadership would know and understand the seriousness of what it means to be called a church leader. And secondly, that you, the followers of the church leadership, would know what to expect from those leaders. We are blessed to have good leaders within our church. Not perfect leaders, uh, but good leaders. Those who stick and adhere to the principles of scriptures. And we're going to see clearly what those qualifications are here this morning. Let's stand together and let's begin by looking at verse 1 of chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you this morning. And we ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would reveal to us, that you would teach us, Lord, that you would not only teach uh, the flock and the body at large here, but you would teach the leaders, Lord, what it is that you expect 
of church leadership. And that we might, Lord, honor you in the way that we lead. And that you would establish, Lord, uh, the, the uh, guidelines, Lord, the, the parameters for what it means to be your leaders, representatives of you. We pray for uh, just a hedge of protection to be put around this place, that there might be no distractions that would hinder what it is that you want to accomplish. Oh, Lord, how we desire to have you instruct us and equip us uh, by your counsel. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is a subject that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, it's a subject that I've given a lot of thought to over the years, not only as I have uh, been involved in church leadership <clears throat> as a church leader, but also as I have come under church leaders that have not been good leaders. And I think it's important that we understand as leaders and also as I prayed uh, that it's important that you understand what you can expect from church leadership. We take that role very seriously here at South Hill Calvary Chapel because as we see this morning in our text, the Lord takes it very seriously. Uh, about a year, <clears throat> maybe a year or two after we started the church, <clears throat> we started the church in 2001. Uh, Jason and I, my son Jason, who's now our, our, our youth pastor and in charge of our worship, uh, he and I were attending a pastor appreciation breakfast at a Christian school. We were excited about it. <clears throat> it was the first one that we'd ever been uh, invited to, and we had a couple kids in our children's ministry, and they gave us the little invitation, and so we went, and we, were, we had to fill out name tags and where we were from, and we're intro they're introducing us to people and going to their classroom, and we're just interacting during the fellowship time. And uh, Jason comes up to me and he says, you know, Dad, I don't know what to put, I don't know, how, how do I introduce myself? What do I tell people that I am? You know, this is a pastor's appreciation uh, breakfast, and, you know, I'm not a pastor, I don't know what I should say. What, and I said, well, you know, just tell them that you're a youth leader. I said, just tell them you're a youth leader. Now, I was confident in Jason's calling to be a pastor, but in no way did I want to be premature in that decision. I wanted to be patient. I wanted to wait on the Lord. I wanted him to confirm what it is that, that I already believed and that Jason already believed. And so we were talking uh, just among different people, and I came across a, a fellow pastor, friend of mine, who happened to be there as well. And he happened to be, I, know that, I knew that he was a very small church, and he happened to mention my youth pastor. He said, well, my youth pastor is doing such and such. And I didn't even know he had a youth pastor. And I remember asking him, uh, your youth pastor? And he said, yes, my youth pastor. And I said, well, have you ordained him yet? And he said, oh, no, you know, gosh, I, I haven't ordained him. I guess that's something I should probably do, isn't it? And unfortunately, as I reflect back on that conversation, I realized that that, that uh, thought or that thinking, that attitude can really typify how churches can look at the subject of Christian leadership. But we must never forget how seriously the Lord takes his calling. When we ordain somebody and when we even have somebody appoint somebody as an elder, we bring them up in front of you. And we challenge them in front of you and before the Lord that they understand the seriousness of the calling on their lives to lead his church. In preparation for my own ordination, as I reflect back on it, I had a pastor that I served under tell me something that an old Bible college professor had told him. He had told him this, remember you can quit a job, but you can never quit a calling. You see, the reality is that the call to be a pastor or an elder or a church leader, it is just that, it is a calling. It is not something that you go down to Pastors Are Us and type in, you know, on a little application form. It's not something, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to give that a whirl. The paper route didn't work. I think I'm going to try the pastor thing. You only work one day a week on Sunday. Uh, you get to talk in front of a lot of people. Pastor appreciation's awesome. I think I'm going to give that a try. It doesn't work that way. You want to make sure that there is a calling of God on your life to be such a leader. Romans chapter 11 29 tells us how God views such a calling. He says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. You can, if God has called you to be a, a leader, you can't not be a leader. Uh, 
because it is a calling on your life. Now, the number one thing that people should look for in leadership, that you should look for in your lo leadership, in anyone who expects you to follow them, is this. Are they modeling their lives after Jesus Christ? That should be the question. Are they modeling their lives after Jesus Christ? Do you see Christ in them? You remember when the apostle said in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. I was thinking that would be a great name, uh, a title for a uh, Christian book on leadership. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I mean, when I read that, when I think of that, when I think that that's the Lord's expectation of me, it makes me kind of cringe. It's a, whoa, Lord, am I able to do that? You see, that is the call on leadership, is to be imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you as followers or people who come under such leadership, you are under no obligation. And in fact, I would even discourage you from blindly following any Christian leader who is not seeking with all of his heart, his mind, his soul, and his strength to imitate Christ. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that they should be perfect because I know from personal experience that that will never happen. But they should be exhibiting maturity and growth in each of the characteristics that we uh, read of here, which Paul speaks of. And if not, then you should be able to challenge them as to why they are not. Always in love, never with a critical spirit, but you should feel comfortable to come up to them. Uh, don't ever think that, oh, I can't go up to them. Don't ever think, and if, if anybody ever, if any of the leadership here ever gets on your case, who are you, who do you think you are to question me? Did you see, do you know whose name's in the bulletin there? If you ever hear that, you know, forget it. Let me know because we probably uh, uh, just didn't get it right. We, we need to give them a little boot out of the, out of the, uh, the old bulletin uh, leadership list there. Our heart needs to be one that is an imitator of Christ. And we need to be willing uh, to uh, allow people to encourage us, allow people to uh, bring to our attention uh, something that maybe we might doing, uh, be doing that's not God-honoring. And you need to feel the freedom to be able to do that. Again, in love, never with a critical spirit, but one, it's something that I want. I want to hear from you in that manner. I may not like it at the time, but in the long run, I know that it'll be an encouragement to me, and it'll make me a better leader, a better pastor. I'll never forget, uh, some of us have had these kinds of experience, but I was a, a worship leader at a very, very small church in Colorado Springs, and, and it was, I think there was probably 25 or 30 uh, people that went to this church. There were seven in our family, and we were feeling called to, to, to leave, and of course, when 15 to 20 percent of your church is going to leave, that's not uh, a good thing, plus your worship leader. And I was meeting with the pastor, and I told him we were going to leave and why we were going to leave. And he said something that just kind of stopped me in my tracks. He said, Ron, you will never learn to follow Jesus until you learn to follow man. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't know where that one is in the Scripture. You see, so many times there are people who have that attitude that you're under obligation to follow a Christian leader because there happens to be a reverend or pastor or, uh, you know, minister or bishop or whatever the case before their title. I've served under a number of pastors who, had ha who have had an agenda. They have had an agenda and it has not been God's agenda. And you never want to come under that kind of a leadership. 1 Peter chapter 5, 2 says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. If a leader is determined to be a follower of Jesus and in, an imitator of Jesus Christ, you will want to come under his leadership. It will be no problem. As leaders, you just be faithful and committed to following uh, the 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 teachings of Jesus Christ, being an imitator of him, and you're not going to have any problem having people come under your leadership. Paul begins in verse 1, this is a faithful saying. He says, you can count on the things that I am about to say as being trustworthy. If a man desires the position of a bishop, now this word bishop, it does not mean as we've come to understand it in Christendom 
today to be a bishop is one that kind of oversees a bunch of uh, littler bishops or a bunch of uh, uh, pastors or overseers or whatever the case. That is a, a, a churchdom definition of bishop. The, bi- the, the definition of bishop here, literally it means overseer. It just means one who oversees. It is interchangeable with elder and pastor and uh, 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 and, and just leader, I guess, a church leader, elder or pastor or, or overseer. And we're very excited about the fact that uh, we have strong leadership here in the church. This past uh, Thursday, Pastor Phil and I met with a couple of representatives of, Har- of the Harvest Crusade, Pastor Greg Laurie, a Harvest Crusade. And the crusade, we're excited, we believe, they believe, and we believe as well that the Lord is bringing the Harvest Crusade to the Seattle Center uh, or Key Arena here in uh, November of this coming year. And so we were talking to these two representatives who had come in and, and we were talking to them about our involvement and how it is that we can be involved. And I was sharing how, how I first heard about Greg Laurie and I was attending one of Pastor Greg Laurie's Bible studies in 1977. And it was at that Bible study that I, I heard uh, just a, a very clear call from the Lord to the ministry. I had no real clue what it meant, but I just heard the voice of the Lord say, that is what you are going to do. And it was that night that, that began the pursuit, uh, a serious pursuit of Jesus and the ministry that would consume my life. And along the way, as I was just trying to glean and learn and come under other pastors and serving them, I would hear them say and insist, oh, I never wanted to be a pastor. I never wanted to be a pastor. I never asked for it. In fact, I ran from it. But then God wrestled me to the ground and he got me in a headlock and he said, this is what you're going to do. I'm dramatizing it just a little bit. But the point is that they were insisting, oh, I never wanted this. And I thought, well, wow, there must be something wrong with me. It really bummed me out. I would think that what is wrong with me? I want it. I want to be a pastor. I want it more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. What is wrong with me? And then, praise the Lord, I came across this verse. This is a faithful saying, that if a man desires the position of a bishop or a pastor or an elder, he desires a good work. Now, mind you, it didn't come fully into fruition uh, until 17 years later, though I am sorry and ashamed to say I did try to force the Lord's hand on a few occasions, but it didn't really come into full fruition until 1994, some 17 years after I heard the call of God in my life. And I want to add to that, that notice he doesn't say, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a, le- a, a, a leisurely uh, a time or a, a, a good time of relaxation and working only one day a week. He didn't say that. He said he desires a good work. He uses the word work. We need to be aware as, as people who are either in leadership or aspiring to leadership that it is hard and sacrificial work. However, if you are truly called, if you are truly called to be in leadership, I will attest to the fact that it can hardly be called work. It just, it never feels like work to me. I'm sure it feels like work at times to my, my wife, Uh, because of the demands, but it just never feels like work to me. I just feel like I'm the most blessed uh, man around to be able to get to do what I get to do. And so he says, if you desire the role of a bishop, a pastor, an elder, an overseer, you desire a good thing. And then he begins in verse 2 to describe these characteristics or these qualifications. And he says, a bishop then must be blameless. Now, it is not in the sense of being perfect. He's saying, Blameless in the sense of not being found guilty of anything that he might be accused of. In other words, he must be a man who is above reproach. One commentator said that the word blameless is a metaphor taken from the case of an expert and skillful pugilist. Do you know what a pugilist is? It's a boxer or a fighter. It's one that's it's taken from the case of an expert boxer or fighter who so defends every part of his body that it is impossible for his antagonist to give one hit. 
It's impossible for the enemy to come in to drive a wedge. It's impossible for accusers to come in and falsely and accuse uh, a pastor or a leader of, of, of doing anything that would misrepresent the Lord. This is what he means by that he must be blameless. He must be the husband of one wife. Now what it means by that is that he must be married to only one wife. Remember that in that culture at that time, polygamy was, co was common in Paul's day. John Corson said this about this verse, the Greek culture, a powerful influence on society in Paul's day, held that every man should have three women in his life, a mistress for conversation, a concubine for pleasure, and a wife to bear his children. Tilt, says Paul, those in the ministry must be one woman men. Only one wife. So if you're wanting to be in leadership and you think you can have a couple of wives, you're going to have to go down the road and check out something else because it doesn't work in Christianity. They must be temperate, it says. This word is vigilant in some translations. In other words, able to keep his cool, not given to extremes. He doesn't fly off the handle when faced with difficult issues or, or difficult people. He handles situations, though firmly and sternly at times, he handles them with much grace. It describes a person who is able to uh, just encourage at the same time that he is bringing correction into their lives. Sober-minded, that means be of sound mind, serious about the work of the ministry. It describes a person who is able to think clearly and with clarity. It doesn't mean that they're just uh, brain dead or that they just, you know, uh, are just uh, stodgy and they, they have no sense of humor. I like what Warren Wiersbe said. He said, it does not mean he has no sense of humor or that he is always solemn and somber. Rather, it suggests that he knows the value of things and does not cheapen the ministry or the gospel message by foolish behavior. I think it's sad when you see pastors that because of foolish behavior and foolish things that they say, they cheapen the ministry uh, of the, or, or the gospel message. I remember shortly after Jenny and I got married, I, I always loved Sundays. I looked forward to going to church, going in early, and I would get up bright and early, and I would just slap my hands together, and I'd say, it's showtime. And uh, I did it every, and, and after several weeks, she just finally, uh, one day she said, I don't want you to say that anymore. I said, well, well, why not? You see, what I was doing is I was suggesting, though I didn't intend to, my actions were suggesting that, okay, time to put the old ministry hat on. I guess I got to go preach the word, or I got to go talk about Jesus. That's what we pastors do on Sunday. I th that wasn't my intent. But you see, by making just that, that, that kind of foolish little comment, not thinking about it, what I was saying to my wife is I was, I was cheapening the ministry by that action. And she told me, she says, I don't like it when you do that. And you know, I've never done that since because she was right on. He is to be of good behavior. In other words, he doesn't do questionable things. He's orderly. It is the same word here translated modest in 1 Timothy 2.9. Dignified would be another way of describing of good behavior. In other words, he is above reproach. We've all known uh, pastors who have failed in some of these areas. And, and, and I don't mean haven't have struggled with trying to fulfill them. I'm talking about have just failed with no regard or concern for having failed in some of these areas, and they fail to realize that it, it, they lose credibility with the people. I lose enough credibility just by being who I am without having to ignore some of these things or suggest that I am above them. These are things that protect the flock, and failure in these areas leads to a loss of, of credibility. They're hospitable. They're generous to guests. When you come to their homes, you, you feel welcome. They're able to teach. They're skillful in teaching. 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We know from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 15, 16, and 17, we know that the word of God completes us. The Word of God completes us, and it equips us for every good work. Pastors need to know how to teach. Elders need to know how to teach. They must understand the Scriptures and how they apply to our lives. People do not need our opinions on things. They need God's opinion. 
And his opinion on all of life is found in the Bible. You can't, uh, you can't help people in their lives. If the word of God completes people, if it, if it instructs them in righteousness and, and equips them for every good work, how can we expect to do that effectively as, as church leaders if we don't know how to study the word of God and how to teach the word of God? Then in verse 3, he begins with some negative qualifications. The things that he, he must not be or must not do. Not given to wine. Now this verse, it does not prohibit uh, the, the use of wine or the use of alcoholic beverage, but it clearly discourages it. I want you to make note of just Leviticus chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what the Lord said to Aaron. The Lord spoke to Aaron. Now Aaron was selected to be, uh, he was of the tribe of Levi, and he was selected to be uh, the high priest. And his descendants were to be the priests or the pastors uh, and the elders of the day. And he says, do not drink wine or intoxicate, intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between clean and clean and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Now this exhortation from the Lord, you remember it came about shortly after the Lord killed Nadab and Abihu. And he killed them because they were offering strange fire in the tabernacle, quite possibly because they had been drinking. And any, uh, any alteration of the brain cells, which we know is what alcohol does, it can cause you to not be able to distinguish between holy and unholy, between things that are clean and unclean, that to not be able to teach accurately the full counsel of God, the word of God. And personally, I believe it best because of the abuse in our culture uh, of alcohol, uh, because of the possibility of causing someone to stumble. Paul said he would never eat meat again if it caused an offense to someone. I personally believe that pastors have no business uh, drinking alcohol. Uh, and and uh, there's a whole movement in Christianity today where they have these parties that they call undrunken parties. And it's like they take this, this freedom that we have in Christ, and in my opinion, they abuse it, and, and they, just, they just drink and they just, they just flaunt it like it's, like it's no big deal. Certainly, uh, at, at the very least, uh, pastors, leaders, church leadership, I think it's best to just completely uh, stay away from it. Uh, I, I don't think it's wise to partake of it. You can come some, to, to some of your own conclusions on that. They're not to be violent. Now, I think this is kind of a no-brainer. I don't think anyone would want to be cared for by a pastor who is prone to violence. I don't think that's a good thing. You go to seek an encouragement word, an encouraging word from them, and they just start yelling at you, and then they slap you a couple times, and they have you leave the office. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. Not greedy for money. I love the way the King James Version says it. Not greedy of filthy lucre. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money, or the love of money, has been the ruin of many a pastor, who because of their position, they feel entitled to extravagant living. Um, and that's a danger. And it's something I was, I'm so grateful, several years ago I had uh, somebody come to me and, and they said to me, I'd never really given it a second thought, but they just said to me, oh, I'm so glad you drive that little truck. And, uh, and I, I didn't even think about it, but they had come from a church where, uh, where there was a, a, a kind of a, an entitlement by the pastor to certain things. And I thought, hmm, shoot, that takes care of me getting that brand new 2011 truck that I wanted to get and I got to drive that little blue truck everywhere. No, I'm just totally kidding you. But it was a reminder to me. It was a reminder to me uh, that Lord, I want to honor you in everything that I, that I do. And, and well, I'm going to just leave it at that because I will get myself in trouble if I keep talking along that way. Calvin said this, 
The man who will not bear poverty patiently and willingly will inevitably become the victim of mean and sordid covetousness. So not greedy for money, but gentle, that is patient. He should be a reasonable man, not quarrelsome, one who does not promote arguments, needing to make his point all the time, not covetous, that is one who is greedy for gain, never satisfied or content. Verse 4, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Two very important verses. Effective leadership, it begins in the home. Effective leadership begins in the home, and a person shouldn't think that they would ever be an effective leader if they are not effectively leading their wives and children and managing their household well. Very, very discouraging. Some of you may have experienced where you see your pastor uh, at church and he's acting one way and he's, he's behaving uh, an another way. He says one thing from the pulpit and then behind closed doors or maybe you walk around the corner and he's just railing on his wife or he's speaking critically of his wife or his, of his children. You need to make sure that you're going to do that in private and that you take your kids to another state when you yell at them and stuff like that. I'm totally kidding. That's not... That's not true. You need to be consistent. I love that. Uh, I, I read a book uh, called one time on character called Who You Are When No One Else Is Looking. And as leaders, we need to be consistent in the way that we speak from the pulpit, the way that we are in public. We need to be the same way at our home, in our homes. That's what uh, the Apostle Paul is saying here. In the past, I've had brothers come up to me with the feeling that they're automatically disqualified from leadership because they have some unruly and, un and rebellious kids. And to that I would say, ask this question, is the rebellion because of the behavior of the parents or is it in spite of their job as parents? In other words, I've talked to leadership in our church and I know, I've, I've prayed with them, I've, I've talked to their children and I know that they've done everything that they can possibly do, that the only reason their household would appear to be out of order is because they have rebellious and unruly children. Uh, children with hearts that are rebellious uh, towards the Lord. And so the question is, is the rebellion because of the parents or in spite of their job as a parent? There is a big difference between the two. Not a novice, verse 6. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. The word novice here it refers to a new convert. Someone who is new to the faith. When you're new in the faith, you can easily want the position for prideful reasons, which is all the more reason you shouldn't be put into leadership. And I'm so grateful that the Lord was patient with me. And I look back on those early years of, of wanting it so bad and wanting to try to make it happen. And I'm so grateful that the Lord made me wait not only 17 years before I became a, an assistant pastor, uh, but then another 10 years after that. So 25, 26 years before he gave me a flock, a, a, a church to pastor. I'm very, very grateful for that because I think it would have been disastrous if I would have done it when I was younger. In essence, this is what Paul is saying. Putting a leader into leadership prematurely is setting up that individual leader for failure at the expense of the people who, whom he is leading. Francis Chan, in his book Crazy Love, said this, The church in America loves to turn saints into celebrities to make known the stories of humble people who have faithfully served Christ in some way. And there is much good that comes of that, but there can be a tragic consequence to it. Too many of these people fall for the praise and start to believe that they are really uh, something special. And so it's important that you don't place somebody prematurely into that position. Occasionally, I'm approached by someone who believes that they're a leader and they, offers, they offer to be used as such, to which I promptly uh, find a position that will test their motives. Uh, uh, early on, uh, when we were needing people for setup and to oversee the setup ministry, I would say, hey, there's a great ministry that you can take the lead for. Uh, and I have found that when you do that, you're able to see really what kind of character they, they have. You're able to see what their motives are. I find that when a person simply wants to be used, no matter what, they really don't care what their responsibility is, and the Lord takes it from there. It's a spiritual principle that if you're faithful with little things, 
then you're going to be entrusted with bigger things. And I've watched over the years, each of the church leaders, they've proven this to be true. None of them sought the positions that they're in now, and in every way they were faithful with every task that they were given. Uh, you look at people like uh, Pastor Allen. He started, he was working at, at Starbucks, came to church. I said, he said, you know, how can I help? I said, why don't you take, take over the setup ministry? And he did that faithfully for a long time. Uh, uh, Jason Strayer, who's one of our chaplains now, same thing. He ran the setup ministry for a long time. Uh, conversely, I've had people that come in years and years ago. This is a long time ago. A person's long gone uh, so that you can't start figuring out who I'm talking about. But a long time ago, they wanted to come and they wanted to be a leader in the church. Uh, they wanted to be the director of one of our uh, main ministries. And, and I said, you know, I don't doubt. I, I know you've got a lot of leadership skills in the business world. I don't doubt that. But let's see what you can do with the setup. And literally, I don't think he lasted more than two or three weeks and just, just completely dropped off and, and, uh, and eventually uh, left. It was, it was his undoing because his motives, his motives and his heart wasn't right. Verse 7 says, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. A good testimony is so important in choosing a leader. It's, it's important to pay close attention to how others see the individual long before you make them a, a leader. Notice Paul says, among those who are outside. In other words, they have a good reputation in the community with people at the grocery store with people at the library and auto repair shops and the YMCA and, and, and the mall, everywhere where they do business. It's a terrible misrepresentation of the Lord when a person asks what you do for a living or, or sees it written on an application when you just got through throwing a fit because your meal came cold or, or, uh, or the service uh, that you received you're unhappy with. Uh, and so... Um, it, you, you got to be mindful, and, and I have to say honestly that sometimes that's a little one of the drawbacks <laughs> uh, of being a pastor because sometimes I just flat get ticked off, and I want to have them, let them have it, and I really believe I'm really justified. I, I'm really trying to be patient, and I do all the things, and then I just want to go, I just want to let them have it, and that's why I take my car to another state to have the work done on it and stuff like that because of that. <laughs> I don't do that. But I am mindful. And I don't want to in any way uh, misrepresent the Lord. And then beginning in verse 8, Paul addresses the role and the qualifications of deacons. And though there's some differences, I want to suggest to you that most certainly a bishop or a pastor or an elder, he needs to exhibit all of these same characteristics as well. Um, and furthermore, I'd say that you show me any Christian leader according to 1 Timothy 3, and I'm going to show you a Christian leader who at one time served faithfully as a deacon. What is a deacon? What is a deacon? Well, clear and simple, by definition, a deacon is a servant. That's what a deacon is, a servant. It's a minister. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we see basically an appointment of the first deacons. The, the number of the believers, the church was growing cr like crazy, um, the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of, of food. And so the apostles, they got together and they started talking about and saying, you know, this isn't a good thing. Uh, we, we're needing to leave the word of God to have to serve tables. And so let's, let's agree. Let's seek out seven good men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that we can appoint over this business of waiting tables. And if you remember, Stephen was one of those individuals. He was a deacon. And he said, and, and, and he was a deacon, he was a waiter. He was a server of tables. And he was also, as we'll talk about here in just a second, he was also the first Christian martyr. Now some have asked, why don't we have deacons in our church? Well, we do have deacons. It's just that they don't have a little badge that says deacon. We don't have a, a little list of deacons that, that lists all the deacons. And that's intentional. The reason that we don't do that. Uh, it is because we don't make it formal or official because sometimes titles can tweak people's heads. They can start getting all puffed up and everything. And, and my feeling is, is that if you need a title, then you probably shouldn't be a leader. There are all kinds of deacons, people who are full of the Holy Spirit, good reputation, full of wisdom, who are just servants of the Lord 
just like we see as described in the book of Acts. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, showing proper respect towards both God and man. Not double-tongued, it says, saying one thing and doing the other. It's, it's not enough to simply teach the word, but leaders must be people who are living the word and applying it to our lives. Not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith. He's speaking here of the revelation of the gospel of Christ. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Uh, those who can adhere to proper doctrine out of sincere and genuine conviction. But let these first also be tested, or let these also first be tested. Um, one commentator said this, deacons and bishops are more recognized than appointed. Let them first be tested. In other words, let them see how they do in just serving in the body of Christ. This also ties into the good testimony. I remember when we ordained our very first pastor, uh, my son, Pastor Jason, and I remember the day clearly we only had one service at the time and I announced uh, that we were going to ordain him and the church broke out in spontaneous applause. In other words, approving, giving their approval that he had been tested, that he had passed the test if you will, approving of the decision. And I'm so grateful that as we've selected leaders within our church, I'm grateful that I've never gotten a list of emails or phone calls just saying, you know, Pastor Ron, what, what were you thinking by appointing that guy as an elder? There's always nothing but affirmation for the decisions that we've made. And I believe it's because we go through this testing process. We're, we're patient. We wait for the Lord to confirm it in their lives. Then let them serve as deacons, it says. That's as servants, as table waiters. Being found blameless. In other words, they have a track record of such behavior. Likewise, their wives. Now, this is an interesting verse. Their wives. In the original translation, wives is translated women. Likewise, their wives must be. Now, we don't know for sure whether Paul's talking about deaconesses. It says in Romans 16, 1, I commend you to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant, the same word for deacon, of the church in Centria. So we know that there was deaconesses. We don't know if he's speaking of deaconesses here or the actual wise of deacons. Uh, the original wording permits either interpretation. But he says they must be reverent, respectful. They must be a people of dignity, having a respect first and foremost for the Lord, which will then result in tremendous respect and love for the people whom they're leading. Not slanders. Literally, it means not devils. Not take talking poorly of others behind their backs. Temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Again, who is a wonderful example of a deacon? You want to see an example of a deacon to model yourself after? Look at Stephen. Stephen was one who served well as a deacon, obtaining for himself a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. On the surface, he was a waiter of tables. He was one who cleaned up the tables. He was one who distributed the food. On the surface, it would appear that that's all he was, but he was so much more than that. And I would encourage you to take some time and read, read Acts 6 and 7. And uh, I'll actually be teaching on that this Saturday at Veritas in a message entitled, Are You Willing to Die for What You Believe? Stephen, a deacon, he was the first Christian martyr in the church, an amazing brother. And so the bottom line, just in summary, the bottom line about this issue of leadership is that leaders are called to be accurate representations of God's heart to the people. God is God, and we are not. And so oftentimes, the leaders act like they're God. He's God, and he takes very seriously how leadership represents him. We've been reading in Leviticus all of the things that the Lord told Moses and repeatedly reminding him, I am the Lord God, over and over and over again, that we are to be holy as he is holy over and over again. We read in Leviticus 22, I believe just yesterday, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. 
I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. At one point, if you remember on Israel's wandering in the wilderness, remember at the beginning, the Lord, they had run out of water. They didn't have water. And the Lord told Moses to strike the rock with his staff and he would provide water for the Israelites. So he did that. And yet years later, after Moses is putting up with these honorary people, and they were honorary, he's putting up with three million people throughout the desert and they run out of water again. But rather than speak to the rock like the Lord told him to, he said, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and I'll bring water out. Moses gets all worked up and he hits the rock with an attitude that misrepresented God. We read about that in Numbers chapter 20. Moses and Aaron, they gathered the assembly together. And then with all kinds of drama, Moses says, Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And then he smacks the rock twice. And yet God, in his mercy, he brings water out of the rock. And in that moment, the Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, Moses... Because you did not believe in me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses, you misrepresented me as being angry with the people when I was not. And therefore, Moses, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. When he was rewriting the law in the book of Deuteronomy, we read in Deuteronomy 3.23, Moses describing this conversation And he says, I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, Oh Lord God, I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. When I think of our responsibility to accurately represent the Lord, when I think what happened to Moses after 40 years of putting up with 3 million people and the Lord saying, you're not going in, I'm reminded of what he said to Isaiah. I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory I will not give to another. The Apostle Paul, the most significant leader in the New Testament, perhaps in all of church history, He exhorted the leadership of the church of Ephesus in this manner. Elders, pastors, bishops, overseers, whatever you want to call them. He gathered them there on the shore of the sea. And he said in Acts 20, 27, I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. I have taught you the full counsel of God, the word of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. You see, as leaders, we must understand that God purchased us with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he does not take lightly the role of leadership in the church. Paul reminded the religious authorities, we ought to obey God rather than men. And our roles as leaders is to accurately represent God in preaching the gospel and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. It is to protect the flock of God which he has entrusted into our care to protect them from savage wolves, from bad teachers that want to push people towards false teaching and shipwreck. And we're not called to be by God. We're not called to be self-esteem counselors to make people feel good about themselves. We're called to discourage sin and to point people towards Jesus Christ. And we don't take that lightly. We're called to speak the truth of God's word into people's lives. All of God's word. Imitating the heart and the love of Christ as we do. Knowing that when we do that, it will judge the thoughts and the attitudes of people's hearts and they may not always like it, but we must obey God. We do not take lightly when we get a phone call and we may be aware of a certain situation in somebody's life and, or they're coming into my, my office and, and I pray and I, I, I shudder at what I'm going to have to say to people. Lord, help me to say the right thing. I know it's going to make people mad. I know they're not going to like me. I know that they might leave the church. 
And oh, the temptation to want to just say, oh, you know, oh, maybe I'll just close my eyes and pretend that it's not happening around me. I, I, I have to resist that temptation. Why? Because the, that would be a misrepresentation of God to, to his people. It would be a way of not protecting them from the enemy. We must obey God. And we do it with joy. Why? We do it with joy because we know, because we have seen over and over and over again that the Word of God transforms people's lives. It rescues them out of darkness and sin. And it ushers them into the glorious arms of a Savior who, per who purchased them with his own blood. It protects them from the enemy. These are the qualifications of a church leader. And you can count on and you should expect absolutely nothing less. Father, we praise you. And we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, just for this sobering word to me, Lord God. Uh, I pray that my heart would always be open to correction. That my heart would always be open to the things that you uh, want to teach us from your word. The things that you want to teach me and the rest of the church leadership in our church, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that those who are aspiring uh, the role of elder or, or pastor, Lord, that it is a good work you declared in our text today. But they would take to heart, Lord God, that it must be a calling. It must be something that you are drawing them to do. And Lord, help us. Help us to do it well. Help us to do it in a way that honors you, that accurately represents you, and that draws other people to the love of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the example he was to us. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, which does indeed judge the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. Oh, Lord, may we receive what you have for us. May we embrace it, knowing, Lord God, that it will transform our lives for good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing.